Welcome to Daring to Suck. I'm your host, Grace Askew, a veteran musician, songwriter, recording artist, and road dog who has been living and breathing my craft for over 15 years. Each episode will dive deep into what it truly looks like to be a working artist. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Come roll along with me, tumbleweeds. All right. Welcome to episode three of Daring to Suck, season one, episode three. This whole first season, we are going to explore artists' journeys. And today we have none other than Joe Leathers, the fabulous Joe Leathers, as your Instagram handle is. (laughs) I love that, by the way. Um, just to, for the listeners who don't know who Joe is, I'm just going to quickly read his bio off of, this is uh, from Curb Publishing's website. Joe Leathers is a Memphis, Tennessee native and highly accomplished songwriter, having earned numerous ASCAP and BMI awards from three top 10 singles and cuts on several platinum and gold certified records. From earning the title track to Kenny Chesney's platinum album, Hemingway's Whiskey, which he co-wrote with Guy Clark, by the way to co-pinning Rust and Kelly's Trying to Let Her. The diversity of Joe's life experiences and musical influences are evident in his songwriting craft. Leather's swing hard, you might hit it approach to life and songwriting has also resulted in notable cuts on Tim McGraw, Lee Bryce, Randy Hauser, Clay Walker, Craig Morgan, Trace Atkins, Kelly Pickler, and many others. So it's such an honor to have you, Joe. Thank you so much. Oh, well, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah. You know, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of yours and love your artistry and the way you write and your whole the whole process that you've been through it's a great story so far and I can't wait to see where that goes so yeah I'm excited to drop our upcoming song this this coming spring the um I've been everywhere man oh yeah I love that that. it's so you I, I feel like that was one of those where all I had to do was sit there and nudge you and because you had the song in you it was waiting to be written so uh, and I could tell <clears throat> that's one of those songs that you needed to write and wanted to write. And there was, yeah. a, there was a little anger in there, <laughs> you know, that you have yeah. to kind of fight, you have to fight for sometimes to write a, a particular song. And I'm just very, I'm thankful that that day, that was the one that happened because it's a great song, I think. Well, you just make it so fluid to write. First of all, co-writes have always intimidated me and from the get-go working with you has really it's taught me so much about how to approach a co-write properly and um you're just a very um just easygoing kind of person so um I appreciate that and I wanted to kind of get a little bit of your backstory and take people back to I'm curious to know kind of what shaped your imagination and I feel like you have this like Mark Twainian kind of quick-witted dry sense of humor to you that I love um I really love it it's very unique and I just I'm curious like was it nurture versus nature for you like what shaped Joe Leather's imagination you know um the whole quick-witted thing my dad referred to that as uh well you got a lot of smart ass in you (laughs) so (laughs) that was was how he labeled that but gosh you know, I've never been asked that question, but honestly, I think it started with, I was always involved in music. As you know, being from Memphis, mm-hmm. everybody you know plays some instrument. It's true. Or bass. I mean, or they wanted to, or they tried and quit or whatever happened, but you're sort of surrounded by that and the whole Memphis thing, which is awesome to be a part, you know, be a part of. Yeah. And I guess the whole writing part of that, I started playing guitar and drums early, like, you know, 9, 10, 11, and just kept on and did the whole cover band thing and all that. But the writing part, I started that early too, I guess around 13. Yeah, and I had a few, I was never very good at math. (laughs) And just not, I just couldn't quite get there but, the choir. yeah <laughs> but English English lit uh I, I remember reading the old man in the sea I had a couple of English teachers that were very rigid and very they were difficult and I love them to death because they always challenged us they were all about writing we would always write mm-hmm. essays all the time and I just love that mm-hmm. and when it came to a math class when it came to that, 
even if I loved the particular teacher or whatever it was, I just couldn't. Yeah. You know, just yeah. Couldn't. But when it came to putting the words down and writing and, and trying to come up with a story that I had to invent or yeah. a character that I had to invent, or if I had to write about, you know, a civil war battle or something else in U.S. or Tennessee state history, I just would write forever. You know, yeah. this, I, one of my teachers would, would say, look, this is supposed to be a four page paper and, you know, you've got 11 here, no way. Me, you know, and I think a part of her loved that. Yeah. But, and I honestly, I can't tell you where that came from. It's just when it was one of those things in my brain when yeah. I was able to to get in and start writing words. And I love words and the way words work together. Yeah. And, uh, I, you know, my wife and kids always laugh at me because I'm always doing word plays. They'll say something or I'll and I'll flip it around or <clears throat> we'll hear lyrics on a song and I'll sing something completely different that in my mind is funny. But yeah. <laughs> so I just love I just love words and language. I, I don't Would know. you say that you have people around you growing up that really helped you feel comfortable with expressing yourself in that way with your writing, or you just had a did you have like a nurturing environment for that? You know, I didn't. It, which is really? interesting. My parents were they were disciplinarians, and thank goodness they were. Yeah. <laughs> left to my own, you know, devices. Who knows? Like a lot of guys, but. They were do the right thing, tell the truth. If you get something out, put it away. If you break something, fix it. If they were just very do the right thing, be a be responsible, be responsible, be responsible. So my brother and I, we sort of walked the line, you know, and it was a little, it wasn't military, but I loved them both. And I loved my dad. He was very strict, but also it was all about sports. They pushed us like really. Be the best you can. Be the best you can. Even I was if it's wondering, best, yeah. You know, if it's not the best, be the best you can be. Yeah. So I think, as a result of that environment, when I got to express myself, yeah. when I got to be creative, I think that's when it was like turning on the spigot because, you know, we were at the dinner table. It was eat your dinner and be quiet. Really. Right? Yeah, don't we don't really talk much at dinner. And we, it was funny because my brother and I would look at each other and one of us would smile and smirk and then we would start laughing and then it was on, you know, <laughs> we both get in trouble the whole time. So, you know, I guess maybe because I didn't, we were, I mean, even when we were young, is it was, you know, children are to be seen and not heard kind of thing. Mm, yeah. And that got better as we got older, but I think maybe that was it because when I got a chance. Yeah. So like you said, express myself, it was on, you know. Love it. And when did that start really happening, would you say? Like you got really into going to Nashville and becoming, you know, or pursuing songwriting? You know, that was kind of an accident. Really? Really, yeah. Which is, which is always the way things like this happen. You know, <laughs> I've been listening to the Matthew McConaughey, his book, Green Lights his audio book. I've listened to it twice now. Really? And I haven't like, heard about that. Oh, it's great. Especially if you're a fan of him. It's called Green Lights. I love him. Yeah. One, he was going to go to law school. Wow. And decided about halfway through, you know, man, I want to, I want to go to film school. You know, his parents were like, he was afraid to tell them because they were going to go, what? Film school? You're going to go be a lawyer. Oh gosh. So, yeah. And they were like, okay, well, make it happen and like the first role he got was he was in a bar and the director happened to have been there and he walked up and said hey how are you and the guy went you know we're going to shoot a scene about a week you might be great for it <laughs> and i know right how does what? that happen? and the first his first line that this is why i'm telling you this because i want you to listen to the book what that all right all right all right right that yeah. was his they told him the scene, set it up, told him about the character, put him in this car. I think it was a vet or a Chevelle or something like that. It said, there's this girl up there and she's really attractive and you're going to drive up and you're going to say something to her. <laughs> and he's sitting in the car and they said action. And he's driving up, no idea what he's going to say. Oh gosh. And he got there and looked out and went, all right, all right, all right. And then it was <laughs> off. So I love it. You know, certainly not on that scale. My thing was a 
there's this Memphis Songwriters Association. Mm -hmm. And I started sort of playing around with that, trying to learn about how to be a better songwriter because I didn't feel like I was really, I loved writing songs and I loved the whole music part of all of that, but I didn't feel like I was very good yet. Okay. And so a friend of mine actually, without me knowing, entered a few of my songs in this MSA, Memphis Songwriters Association contest. And how old would you have been at this point? Oh, I guess I was 30. 30, okay. Yeah, I mean, I had been, up to that point, I'd been in a band and had, you know, had a job, had kids, had a wife. I kind of did it backwards. <laughs> I didn't just move to Nashville and sleep in my car or move to LA or move to Austin or whatever. Uh, because I guess I was a little, I was just afraid of it, I guess. I don't oh, know. I hear that. Yeah. Well, I couldn't commit to it, maybe. Yeah. I wasn't ready just to say, poof, I'm pulling, you know, I'm, let's yeah. pull it. So played in cover bands, was in a band. We actually put out an album and it was uh, average, you know, and without really any expectations to what would happen from it. We just wanted to do it, songs we'd all written. So do this contest and I win two categories and runner up in one. And Ralph Murphy, who was at ASCAP at the time, Ralph's a Nashville icon, legend, uh, was one of the judges and he pulled me over after he went, hey man, you, who are you? And I told him, he said, well, do you ever think about coming to Nashville and kind of getting involved in that songwriting scene? And I was like, man, I never really have. You know, I've, I've been up there a few times and yeah. a couple shows up there and he goes, I'd like you to come by ASCAP and, and see me next week. Awesome. I was like, what? Wow. <sighs> I wasn't even supposed to be here. My friend entered these songs. Right. Ralph Murphy. So, <laughs> By uh, the way, are these songs available? Like, can you listen to them on Spotify? Or did you ever release those winning songs? Uh, I think one of them might be on Spotify. Okay. Because I like to make playlists for every interview I do. So people can listen to kind of your history of your music. So, you know, I've got a, a playlist. I think it's called, maybe I'll send you the link. I think yeah. it's called... Um, Songs written by amazing songwriters and Joe Leathers. I think oh, okay. Okay, I think cool. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, so I'll go up and visit Ralph and he said, you know, you're, you're average right now, but there's a few lines every now and again that really struck me. And he said, I think with some time, I think maybe you'll be able to maybe write competitive songs. Wow. And I said, well, what do I do? because it was absolute rocket fuel for me because if I it's one of those things if I think I have a chance yeah I'm prob don't take this the wrong way but I'm probably gonna win I just There's my whole life competitively everything I've done I just I'm like I'm just gonna kick everybody's ass I'm sorry You've told me something like this before, not in that like in that way, but I asked you, I remember asking you something about like, how did you get here? And you said, and it stuck with me, um, you just didn't know it couldn't be done. I didn't because everybody, you know, I had friends that would, because I'm working at a bank, you know, <laughs> yeah. and I got friends that, that people find out that I didn't talk about it because I knew yeah. you would get the eye roll, right? And right which I'm not afraid of that. I don't care because I know who I am and what I'm trying to do. And I don't really worry about anybody else's opinion unless I value their opinion. Now, if I, mm. I Ralph Murphy, I valued his opinion. So right. attention, but if it's one of my buddies, it's just giving me a hard time. I don't even. Man, know. I need to learn how to get better about that for sure. Oh, about opinion? Just like not caring. The people who are, you know, as invested, not caring about their opinions, but the people who do matter, you know. Well, and, you know, not care sounds a little cavalier. I don't, that's probably not the right <clears throat> choice of words. I just don't let them affect my drive and my goal and where I'm headed. Right. Because unless somebody's in my boat with me, then they don't get a paddle. They don't yeah. get to me if it works or not, you know, yeah. so, uh, you know. Yeah, I love I that. Met with Ralph and. He connected me with a few writers and said, you need to start driving up here and playing every writer's night you can play and you'll build your circle. Wow. 
and you'll meet other writers who like you. He said, I cannot do it for you. Yeah. If you'll, you will find people who are drawn to your writing and you'll sit in these writers nights and you'll find people you're drawn to. Mm. You'll develop your circle. Yes. You can't get into the top A-list songwriter circles right now. You have nothing to offer them. Mm, yeah. When you have something to offer them, they'll let you in. What amazing advice to get right off of that. <laughs> oh, he was just, he's such a sage, you know, he's, yeah. um, I, I'm just so thankful for, so I had someone that <clears throat> would give me a little direction early on because so many people that I know ask the same question, man, how do you do it? Yeah. I've got songs, I've got this, I've got, and I'm like, man, you go to Nashville. Yeah. Right? Or you go wherever, you, where, you go to your local town. You're, if you're in Detroit, you find the open mic or you find the writer's night and you start playing your songs. And you, totally. yeah. you, you just, you can't keep them in your bedroom. They yeah. They're not ever going to do anything. That's the nice safe place for them. Yeah. Right? You kind of go to go out there and get your butt kicked. And so you can kind of measure where you are. Yeah. So, you know, this is the NFL, man. It's, it's, it's so it's true. Like, That's the best way I learned is I talked about in episode one of my artist's journey is like, I went to play Neil's every Wednesday in Midtown before it burnt down that dive bar. And that's how I got better because I heard how amazing uh, these other songwriters were, you know, and it was like a reality check. So I totally agree with the journey you took. And it's just, it's a perfect example of what it really takes, you know, to get better. Well, what is it in you? I, I, I'm curious to know this because <clears throat> this is one of the keys sort of to success, however you define that and what we do. When you're at a writer's night or at a, a live show, what is it about a writer or a song that makes you step back and say, I need to be better at that or wow, that was amazing. What is that thing? A lot of people ask that question. It's so, it's just, it's really hard to put a finger on it. I feel like it's so unique to everybody. Um, but I, the best way I can put it really is like, you can tell it's completely authentic to them. It's like the thumbprint, you know, it's so unique or fingerprint. I mean, it's just completely unique to them and it's, there's no fakeness to it. And that's what attracts me. So well, I think people see right through that when it's not authentic. When yeah. it's not authentic, you know, but it's true. when you're up there doing your thing, which is art as artistic as it gets <laughs> or a singer songwriter. Well, it is. You're you, I mean, I'm a, just a big fan. I'm just telling you. Um, when you do your thing, everyone in the audience is going, What? <laughs> oh my God. Because it is real. Thank you. And you say words in your songs that a lot of people are afraid to say. And I, do that too. I do that too sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Because sometimes there's only one word that'll work and it's not a, the most popular word <laughs> you know, in this Sunday's uh, church bulletin. That's true. So, so you gotta. Yeah. So. No. Well, I love that you, so you took to the bars and you did, so you started playing out in these writer's nights and for years and years, or like how long did it take until you kind of found your circle, so to speak? It took me, I met two guys, went on a songwriting workshop weekend. Nice. Yeah. It was like $400, $500. So worth it though, stuff like that. Well, it's expensive, but can you afford not to do it? That was the question I asked myself. And I was taking some online, some Berkeley online songwriting classes. Right. A guy named Pat Patterson, and he's amazing. And that really helped me with some of the technical stuff. Uh -huh. And met two guys that I still write with, as a matter of fact. And, <clears throat> you know, that process went on from the day I met Jack to when I actually got signed to, my, to a publishing deal. Well, I'm sorry, Ralph, it was about three years. Wow, okay. Yeah, of playing writer's nights, doing, you know, writing songs. I wrote, I was probably writing about 70 songs a year, something like that. Nice. And the ones that, and I would, I would still all along meet with publishers. They would, I'd, I would just pick up the phone and call BMG or Curb or Warner or whoever and, and 
talk to one of the creative, get to one of the creative directors and say, hey, I'm Joe Leathers. I'm a songwriter. I'd love to come play some songs if you have time. Some of them would say, I can't. Some of them would say, we don't accept, un we don't unsolicited material. Right. And a few of them would say, all right, come on. So they, I'd play them two or three songs. Most of the time they would listen to a verse from the chorus and then fast forward because they know they hear 100 songs a week, you know, mm -hmm. from their staff writer. So I did that process, kept playing songs for publishers for, and then about two years into that process, mm -hmm. I would pay for my own demos, go get them tracked, you know, by real band, real Nashville guys. And did some in Memphis, a guy named Jack Holder, who is a legend, God rest his soul, I miss him. But Jack tracked some of my things for me. And I knew some of the guys at Arden. So everybody was kind of helpful, which is nice. Yeah. People that are in it for profit, you know, you got to know which ones are there and which ones are there for the dollar. So started doing my own demos and taking the full fledged demos to these publisher meetings. And about six months, you know, two years and six months in, I had three publishers that were in the process of offering me a deal. It wasn't a big glamour deal, but it was just in the door. Yeah. And finally, about three, it was about three years, just about to the month. And I got signed at Curb. And thank goodness. And, <laughs> you know, I thought I had won the lottery. But what I found out is that, okay, you're signed to a publisher. Mm -hmm. What you got? Mm. What you got? Now you have to deliver because what you've been doing, yeah, just got just proved to everyone that you're willing to work, yeah, put in the time, the blood, the sweats, the tears, you know, the tears, mm -hmm. you know how it is. And that's as big a part of it as anything is that most songwriters can write a damn good song, right? But can you write 50 of them this year? Oh, hell yeah, I love it, I love it because that is just that's the gospel right there. Like we were talking about this in episode two with Park Chisholm who produced our song, our co-write. And he just said, you kind of have to get blue collar about it. That's kind of the best expression I've heard. It's like, this is just what I do. You just oh, sit down and you do the work and it's a job. It, that's absolutely what it is. And it's nothing other than that. It's just like laying bricks or yeah. working at Home Depot. You go in and your product just happens to be songs. That's what right. you're and you got to do it like you got to do it every day. You, you yeah. know, we've talked about this before. One of the big parts of what we do is even when you don't want to, you got to show up. Mm -hmm. And everyone has the process. I have my process. I have my creative space. I can only write in my chair with my incense and my candle and the room's painted red or, you know, what everybody <laughs> has their, you know, what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, you got to let all of that go. Yes. You know, if it's for you and for your album as an artist, you can sit in your creative space that's perfect for you because everybody has one that they like and write that song. Mm -hmm. But if you're in the business and you're trying to do your job, yeah. Process, you have to put the process away and you have to be a slave to the song where. Yeah. They put you in a situation with somebody who writes tracks. You might have to carry the lyric that day. If it's if it's someone who doesn't play an instrument, who's a great lyricist, yeah. you got to carry the music that day. So or true. There's some days where you just don't have it. Yeah. Right? But you're still in a co-write, and you have to find a way to participate and contribute because yeah, your process doesn't matter as a competitive songwriter trying to get songs on the radio yeah it's so true I, you see those like old uh clips of bob dylan in the documentaries you know and he's like on his typewriter and the room's filled with people talking and partying and smoking cigarettes and he's just like on his typewriter writing completely right. oblivious he's working you know always so it's just it's kind of that mentality of like and i used to be very sacred about it you know and like i needed my space and which is still nice for my own projects like you said but like again going to co-writes with people you've never met 
you have to immediately cut out the, like, the get to know you part and start getting to work and, and just treat it as, as a job. So I, I completely agree with everything you're saying. <laughs> right. But look, the people, it is a job. Okay. And you treat it like a job, but the people that you're across from writing this song have that same mindset. And everybody that I write with, I've kind of narrowed it a little and pruned it. Everybody that I write with is absolutely 100%. Their mindset is this song has to be amazing. It can't just be, oh, we did our job today. Now, every song's not like yeah. a tough song, right? right. But everyone is and diligent about it and they apply the things they've learned over 10 or 15 years or however many years it's been of what works and what doesn't work and you get one or two co-writers in a room and when you have everybody applying that even though it is a job and that might sound like it's a little sterile it's not it's still yeah. got as creative a spirit as you can ever imagine because you got such pros that you're surrounded by right and it's like even having that time constraint helps fuel it I feel like like I have a cap with most co-writes. I don't want to write more than two hours with somebody on the song. Like, I don't know if that's like a bad method, but that's just how I, I like to function. Cause you can always go back to it the next week with someone, but I get drained after like two hours or, you know, maybe two and a half of working on, you know, with one person on something. Yeah. I'm glad you said that. And yeah. something to you earlier before we started this podcast. Yeah. And- I wrote with somebody last week and he's top tier Grammy winner, you know, total A-list guy. I don't know how many number ones, but it's in the twenties, thirties, something like that. And he started this riff and immediately it was like, what the, what is that? Let's write that right now. He was like, well, all right, let's go. (laughs) And I had a couple of ideas and I threw one out and he went, that's it. Let's go. I love it. it went and went and we were just like, we're on fire. Just everything was great. The melody was falling out of everywhere and it was really good. And about an hour in, I started, I think it was me overthinking it a little bit. Mm, yeah. And, like going and, back to parts that you had already claimed were finished. A little. Yeah. yeah. A couple of words. What about this word? Or what I like, I was going backwards rather than, you know, we were a we were a verse, a chorus, and a verse in, and we had another verse and maybe a bridge. I don't know. And I got stuck on what are we going to say in this next verse? And then uh, that which made me go back and start looking at words in the top spot. And he went, Hey, 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 get out of your own way. Uh, <laughs> I love it. And it was great. And I thought it was like he put oxygen on. You know? <laughs> okay, get out of my own way. Just I love it. Stop you said you're like an hour and a half in. Yeah, about that. See, that's yeah. about when you should be wrapping it up. I feel like <laughs> you can be, and then you edit. Can be. Later, but, you know, he's like, "Hey, man, s- stop thinking about songwriting while you're writing a song." That's the yeah. He's like, "Thank you. Let's go." I love that. Yeah. Hey, I hope y'all are enjoying the episode so far. Really quick before we continue. I see these episodes as a form of priceless mentorship, and that's something I always wished I had in my own journey. If you also feel you are getting something of value from these conversations from veteran working artists, there is a way to support the show and keep it going. For just $3 a month, you can become a personal patron to the podcast by joining over at patreon.com slash graceaskyou. Or if you'd like to be a one-time supporter, you can name your price and throw in what you'd like to the virtual tip jar at paypal.me slash graceaskyou. Either way, your listenership means so much to me. All right, let's get back to the show. There's a great part in Anne Lamott's book, Bird by Bird. It's a fantastic just book on writing. And she's like, that first draft or first you know take it a song or whatever you're writing is like letting a kid loose on a playground kind of view it that way I thought that was a kind of a cool way to think about it it is because you're usually right the first time you usually yeah. your your initial emotion or whatever that inspiration was you're usually right and then you can go back and edit it later yeah if you need to but let it happen while it's happening because you you can throw cold water on it and it's over and you walk away going that was my fault I did it yeah 
Well, I, you know, you're going to make, I want to make you tell the Guy Clark story, how, how that happened and then how it was to write with Guy Clark in the first place. <laughs> so, it's just, it's just an amazing story. Well, I mean, do you want all the way back to the song idea or just the Guy Clark? The guy that you met at the, you know. Okay. Yeah. So <clears throat> I mentioned earlier, I've always been a fan of literature. Um, and I went to do the Key West Songwriters Festival, which they have every year, and it's a blast. It's, it is absolute hedonism. I mean, it's spring break for Nashville people, you know, <laughs> and I don't, as a matter of fact, I don't even go anymore because really? it's, like, yeah, Too wild. Uh, there's nothing for me there. You know, there's the net, there's no like networking, you know, everybody already. So what are you going to do? Right. Yeah. Um, so I go, I'm a huge Ernest Hemingway fan, just everything about him. I read a lot about him and read most of his books. So I go to the, the tour of his house down there. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> it's by this huge lighthouse, biggest lighthouse on Key West, because they said, the legend has it, that he, he bought that house because when he had too much to drink at night at the bars, all he had to do was find the lighthouse and he'd just walk right home. So the he's got this beautiful house right there on the water across the street from the water and I go do the tour and I come out this is 10 in the morning when I, I'm finished 10 30 and I sit down on a bench out front and I'm just kind of hanging out for a minute and there's a guy sitting on the curb I'm going to say mid late 70s something like that hard to tell but somewhere in there and he's got a little canvas backpack and sitting next to him on the curb is like a can. It was like he cut the top off of a Coke can. It was full of pencils. And then he had a spiral top notebook laying next to that. And he was just sitting there, you know, and he looked back over his shoulder and I'm sitting back there. He went, hey, buddy. I'm like, hey, man. He goes, you go to the tour? I said, I did. He goes, what'd you think? I said, I think it was awesome. And I think I want to go, I'll probably, I might go do it again tomorrow. He goes, yeah. You know, he's, uh, he's my hero, man. I said, yeah, mine too, kind of. I, I really, I really love everything about him. And he said, you know, I'm here. I am, uh, I'm writing the next great American novel because uh, he's my hero. And I want to do it right here in front of his house. I said, that is awesome. What a great idea. I mean, what, how much more creative and inspiring could your environment be? Mm -hmm. He said, I don't know. This is it, man. This is it. And he reaches in his little pack and he pulls out a little pint of whiskey and he takes a little swig and he hands it back. He goes, hey, man, you want to hit? He's like, no, 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 I'm good, man. I'm good. And I, I said, well, uh, how, how long uh, you've been working on your book? And he said, well, I got a, I got a working title and I got, I got a few, some character development notes in here and a couple lines. I said, when'd you start? And he's like, um, 1973. <laughs> 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 Persistence, man. Stay at it. And so he takes another swig of his whiskey, hands it back. He goes, you sure you don't want to pull? I said, I don't. I'm, I'm really good. He goes, hey, man, that's Hemingway's whiskey, you know? If it's, if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for you. And all of a sudden, this thing hit me. And I just went, Gosh. <laughs> so every, if you've not been to Key West, everybody rides scooters. So I jump on my little scooter. And I mean, I mean, I haul ass back to my room and pick up my guitar. And I write a, a verse and a chorus. And I had some th things to do that day. We had some shows. So put it away, got back to, and remembered it because I just remember, I was thinking, man, this, this cannot get away. This is a yeah. song I have to finish. So get back to Nashville and I'm going to a songwriter's retreat, show up. And my first write of this retreat is with a buddy of mine I know pretty well, his name's Ray Stevenson. And we're talking about song ideas and we talked, we threw out about six or eight or 10 and nothing really you know, hit either one of us right between the eyes. And I said, what about this, Ray? And I played him the verse and the chorus and he went, stop, stop, stop. 
I'm thinking, whoa. And I know him well enough where he'll go, man, that sucks. Right. <laughs> he goes, man, we're going to write that with Guy Clark. And I said, what? He said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm calling Guy tomorrow. We're going to write that with Guy. That is, I know he'll, he will flip about that. And I said, okay. Sure. So, <laughs> so you know, about two weeks later, the, Ray calls me and said, hey, man, we're going to write, you know, Thursday, Guy's house. And I said, okay, Amazing. we're going to Guy's house to write. All right, that'll work. Was that so, in Tennessee area or was that? It's in Nashville. Oh, okay, okay. So, yeah, he and his wife had lived there, you know, gosh, 20 years, 25 years, something like that. Wow, okay. And he writes down in this basement and he hand builds guitars and they're hung all around the room. So cool. Oh, I know. And he's sitting there and he writes on graph paper. I love that. <laughs> every in pencil, every letter goes in a box and we play it for him. Ray had already told him about the idea. And he's like, yeah, man. Yep. Yep. That song's got to be written and it's got to be written by us. And I said, okay. He goes, so Ray was in the room too this whole time. Ray was in the room too. Okay, yeah. I forgot that part of the story. Okay. Yeah. Ray was there too. And he goes, what's the, what's the, uh, what are you thinking here? And I said, well, you know, it's about a girl. She's your muse. You know, she's your, what whiskey was to Ernest Hemingway, you know, kind of, he writes about how it got him through and never let him down. And <clears throat> he goes, ain't about a girl. <laughs> and Ray said, yeah, guy, it's about a girl. Listen, see, here's what happens. And, you know, we're telling Guy Clark. Right. Was, yeah. Right? He doesn't get what we were thinking. Yeah. He goes, yeah, I know. I, I get it. I get the muse. I know. I know that. <laughs> And I said, yeah, you know, if it, and I said, if it, you know, if it's good enough for Hemingway's whiskey, if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me, you know, if it's good enough for you. And he goes, no, man, it ain't about a girl. And he goes, and it's not, if it's good enough, he goes, he's, if it's bad enough for him, it's bad enough for me. Mm. Whoa. Yeah. And then he went into why he said, well, you know, that whiskey didn't serve him very well. You know, and yeah. if you're writing about a girl, then that whiskey, that muse didn't serve your song, your singer very well. So it ain't about a girl. So love it. We, of course, said, yeah, it's not about a girl. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> I, I was still fighting it a little bit because to me, it was about Were you? Okay. <laughs> a little bit. But I mean, well, I didn't bring it up again. I let it go because right. he's it's right. Yeah. Uh, and we finished it, I guess, that day and didn't have a bridge and he said hey boys would y'all mind if i just wrote the bridge by myself mm. <laughs> no we had a bridge i'm sorry it was just kind of filler pedestrian until we could find something that we really love okay. hey, i'm gonna write this bridge by myself do y'all mind like, no don't mind at all you know let us know what you think he goes i'll run it by y'all you know yeah <laughs> like okay um how does he run it by y'all like like a voice memo like how does he oh, he, he called and sang it oh my god guy clark's he... <laughs> i know it's crazy <laughs> and then he called ray you know and we both were like okay it's fine yeah uh, and he put it on his album yes that album yeah. man it's just gold it was it was like the album was got nominated that year uh for a grammy and it didn't win it probably shouldn't have wow and, yeah but <clears throat> I mean, it was probably, they were probably right that year. I can't remember what it was, but it was a fantastic album. might've been Chris. Sometimes Taylor. a song writes you or something. Is that what it's called? I think that's it. I think that's it. The code is on that album. I love that song. Yeah, man. He, um, he's somebody to study if you're really yeah. trying to, to hone the craft, you know, and then yeah. he put it on his album and Kenny Chesney had always been, see, this is another thing is, Things like this really just don't happen. You normally write the song, you pitch it, your publisher pitches it to an A&R rep or to an artist or a producer, and they say, yeah, we like it, we're going to record it. Right. Well, this, in this case, Kenny bought the Guy Clark album, bought it, and uh, <laughs> was riding around his truck listening and heard the song and went, damn, you know, because his apparently his grandfather had been a huge fan mm. and told him all about it anyway. So he called 
my he looked at the song credits, called the, our publishers and said, well, I had Buddy Cannon call our publishers and said, we're going to cut this song. And I got the call and from uh, my publisher. He said, hey, man, Chesney's going to cut Hemingway's whiskey. I said, what the? Did you? <laughs> he went, no, man. I said, how did he hear it? And he told me, it's like, oh, my gosh. That's amazing. That's why you got to show up and you got to stay in the game. Yeah. You know? And so yeah, just to give people context here, like from when you started at 30, how old were you when this opportunity came about? 38. So eight years you have been plugging away just to give people an idea of like how hardcore this well, is. <laughs> a little, there's, a, there's a guy in Memphis that uh, he's 20 and I coached him in peewee football. He's a friend of my son's. And he's a really good musician and he's a really good singer and he's been in a band and he asked me if I would help him. And I said, of course, cause I've known him forever and how would I not help him? Yeah. And we've written a few songs. I've kind of let him write them and I'll kind of nudge him in a particular direction. Okay. Now. And I turned one of them into my publisher just because I'm obligated. Everything I write, I have to turn it, I have to submit it, you know? Gotcha. Okay. Well, he called me or, or no, he would text me. Uh, not much phone calling going on with the 20 year olds. There's a lot of texting. Yeah, a lot of texting. <laughs> yeah. So, hey, have they said anything? Have they said anything? Have you heard anything? I was like, no. What that means is keep writing songs. He went, gosh, man, that song's great. I said, it is. It is. But when I got my first cut, which was by Jason Michael Carroll, I had 327 songs on the curb hard drive before I got my first cut. Yeah, and that's worth repeating. That's just, that's amazing. I know, but, and people like Andrew, I'm sorry, there's artists, I'm, this singer I'm talking about went, what? Yeah. I was like, yeah. Yeah. That, you know, I had just gotten started, man. Right. You know? And it kind of blew him away. He was like, whoa. And I said, how many songs have you written? 40? <laughs> so keep writing keep going <laughs> okay what yeah. that means is you're just learning man you don't even you're not even you're 20 you don't this even is, know. yeah yeah you're segueing perfectly into like this is kind of the last question I had for you is is advice you would give for artists who are struggling to to get you know their foot in the door with their their craft and everything in Nashville or wherever they want to be um I guess your advice would be to keep writing Absolutely. That's number one. Don't listen to the little voices in your head mm -hmm. that tell you stop, don't quit, stop, don't, you know, you're not good enough. You know, you are good enough, but you have to do the work. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you have to have laser focus or I, in my case, I had to have laser focus on, there's no plan B. I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. If you have a bailout plan, then are you really in it? I love that. Be an artist or yeah. be a song. You, yeah. I think you're not. I think you're really not. I think you're you're going to try at it. Yeah. But 100% totally into it. I, can I tell one quick story? Yeah. Uh, I wrote last week with, there were two guys on The Voice and as individual artists. Okay. And I think they finished, they both finished top 10. Okay. Wow. One from California, I can't remember where Caleb's from, but they came back to Nashville and there's a, a record label, Black River Entertainment, big label, was going to audition them both because they had both done so well on the show. They were like, you know, you guys come give us a chance, uh, give us an audition. And they, Black River has this big staging area set up in the this complex so they can have showcases and that kind of thing. Well, they've got the whole staff, creative staff, a &R staff, all the label people. These guys perform a song. Guy goes first. His name's Pryor. Pryor Baird, he's amazing. And his partner goes second. His now partner. That's a good part of the story. <laughs> and they were like, wow, you guys are great. And one of the label execs said, hey, would you mind singing the background vocals on that chorus that 
Pryor just saying, I wanted to see what it would sound like if it had background vocals on it. <laughs> sure, glad to. Goes up there, they do the song, they write the, uh, they do the chorus with the background vocals and blew everybody on the label away. And they signed them that day as a duo. Wow. And they're called Pryor and Lee. Well, here's the thing. And he, he actually started crying when he told me the story. He's 36 years old. Uh, Pryor Baird said, man, I had my truck and my trailer packed out in the parking lot going home to California. Man, After it's always right when you want to give up that this kind of stuff happens. You can't stop knocking one door early. So true. You never know if that one rejection right beyond it is the, the yes. That's you know. it. That happened six months ago. That's amazing. I gave me goosebumps. <laughs> he was ready to go. He was packed. And by chance, somebody said, hey, man, sing that background vocal for Pryor over there, will you? You know, and now they're, they're a duo signed to a major label and by accident. Neither one of them wow. thought it was going to happen when they walked in the door that day, but they showed up, man. And yeah. they did the thing, you know, yeah. and, and that's the, that is, that I think is much more powerful than words of advice that anybody can give you is stories just like that. Cause I've seen it happen all the time. Totally. You know, Love there's that. a bunch of people headed to Nashville today. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of people leaving Nashville today. Oh, totally. Every day. Yeah. Of the week, you would know. you say that you would also as last bit of advice, you would have to also just love the process of songwriting itself because, and you know, I, I say that because I, I try to keep the Nashville and the industry kind of side of things out of my head um, when I'm writing. Um, and it just depends on who I'm writing. If I'm writing with you, then you're, you're so good at knowing what works, you know, for pitching and stuff. But overall, I feel like, would you agree that loving the process itself is so crucial? I don't think there's anything bigger than that because if you don't love the songwriting process and the end product that you created from a blank piece of space. If you're not that, most of the successful people that I know that are artists or singer songwriters, they're songwriters first and they yeah. never turn it off. You can't ever. It's so true. <laughs> anytime they walk by a guitar, they pick it up every time. And, and there are people that are just, there are artists that are just looking for a hit song. They're not really writers. Yeah, and, and that's fine too. But if you don't have songwriting at your very core of your soul, if that's not who you are, if that's not what you really want to be, then honestly, you need to keep writing songs for you. But the business is not for you. Yeah, yeah. Unless that's really who you are, and if that whole process of starting with zero and ending up with something that you're absolutely have your heart and soul in, then mm -hmm. it, then it's probably not for you. So true. But if it is, you can't ever quit because you never know when that song is going to happen. Yes, I love it. That's that's a great way to to end out this this amazing interview. I, I appreciate you so much. Like that's just words of wisdom right there. I feel like I've gone through seasons of being extremely discouraged and wanting to give up, even though it's like in my bones to be a writer. But then something happens, a break happens that I did not see coming and or I met like you, you know, and it's just. It's because you show up, you do it every day. You yeah. know, when you did your 700 and how many days was it? 730. <laughs> that fired me up. That made me up like I was a loser. And look, <laughs> I'm serious. These are things I've, I'm telling myself. I'm not necessarily telling you yeah. these things we're, that we're discussing and sharing with each other. I have to tell myself this every day when I get up, I've got to get up and go, okay, you have the best opportunity in the world. Do you know how many people would love to have your seat right now? Yeah. You know how many would love to be holding that guitar on that stage. Yeah. You're somewhere in Texas playing for 24 people. You know, half the people in the audience would love to be able to have the opportunity that you have. Yeah. Yeah. So either take that opportunity and run with it as hard as you can, or let somebody else have it that really wants it, that's hungering for it. Yes. Because 
you know, we're in a spot that a lot of people would love to be in and it's hard to get a spot. There's not many seats on and the track. And I take it for granted, I do, because I remember there were so many times in that two year daily songwriting challenge where I felt so discouraged because nothing was happening, you know, according to my timeline of like how I, I thought it should, it should work. But it, then I like, you know, it was a wake up call. It's like, go back to the process, go back to the meaningful side of this like you're doing this because you want to become a better songwriter and not because you you want to break you know what i mean right stop listening to that little voice yeah listen to it yeah well um so what i just want you to end out like what's next and what's new with you i know lee bryce just dropped a record with several songs or how many songs are on the record that y'all heard he's his album hey world was just released last thursday i've got two songs on that album awesome and really excited about that. But, you know, here's another thing. I've been writing with Lee for a long time. For this album, I probably co-wrote 30 songs with him. Wow. And two made it. Wow. There you go. There's a good ratio. <laughs> writing, that's writing with the artist. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, if you're if you're not writing with the artist, you kind of have to to make those odds a little bigger, but you have to know that and you have to not be afraid of that because yeah. it does happen. And I'm a perfect example of that. It can happen. You just have to know that you have to be too dumb to know it can't. Yep. And and that's kind of what I am is that I don't I don't listen to any of that. I just keep doing what I can do. You didn't and, know it couldn't be done. <laughs> right. I didn't. Nobody told me. No, I, I didn't that. listen if they did. So Oh, cool. Well, you're such an inspiration to many people. And um, especially after you spoke at my workshop last year, people were just floored. So thank you so much for being a mentor to many people and for sharing your, your time. Well, look, hey, I learned a ton at the workshop myself. So I, I, I'm a big fan of that. And I love you as a person and as an artist. And I'm just, uh, I'm pulling for you as hard as I can. And uh, I, you know, I hope we get to write some great songs. Oh, yeah. I, hope, I hope the world gets to hear some of them. So yes, absolutely. All right. If you book something, show up. <laughs> Damn straight. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. I'll see you. Right. Thank you. Well, that's a wrap, y'all. To see our full conversation, you can go to youtube.com forward slash Grace Askew. You can also go to the Grace Askew Spotify page to enjoy a fully curated playlist for each week's episode. And y'all, don't be scared to slide on into my DMs on Instagram with any questions, comments, or insights you'd like to share. Thanks for listening to Daring to Suck. I'll see y'all next Monday for another fresh episode.